we'll just uh, give a little bit of a moment to give the chance for the other folks to come in as everybody is beginning to join the conversation. Hello, everyone. Can you all hear me? Okay, all right. Um, welcome to this week's Messy Conversation. Good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you're located. I'm Anna Kwong, the chair of our Antioch Santa Barbara BA program. Today's topic, why, are, why we are still mad, the righteous anger of black women and girls. Wow, can you imagine that? This is so powerful and inspiring. But first and foremost, let me uh, mention about a couple of things. Um, I'd like to remind you all about the two upcoming messy conversation for the next two weeks. Next week, we're gonna do 1619, the book. And you can see on the chat is that those are the chapters that we're going to do. And then the following week we'll do, uh, let me see, I have, I lost my, you know, in the, There you go, okay, I lost my page. Okay, Afrofuturism. Um, so that's on the Valentine's Day, okay? Um, and then after that, that's uh, the President's Day, okay? So I hope that you all remember to join us uh, for the next two weeks as well. Um, anyway, so I'll go, I'm going to mention a few rules of this platform. Uh, uh, first, uh, please mute yourself and stay muted until it's time for you to to speak or you want to speak. Um, uh, we welcome and encourage all questions, responses, comments to be posted on the chat. The conversational list uh, will converse for around 30 minutes, uh, 40 minutes, uh, and then we will open up for Q&A sessions. Uh, with no further ado, I mean, I would like to introduce our very, very exciting um, guest. Uh, uh, let me let me uh, introduce you, uh, Professor Lapoya Kato Gesesa. I hope I did it right. Okay, um, she's a devoted member of AULA community. She received her BA in English from Lake Forest College, where she focused her studies on African American women writers. Um, since then, she has held a variety of instruction and supporting role at AULA. She's currently serves as a teaching faculty of the undergraduate studies department, an academic writing mentor and specialist, and an independent studies coordinator. Her teaching covers a range of writing, business, and education classes. Uh, and most enjoy, she most enjoy helping AULA students from diverse backgrounds learn to navigate the higher education system. So Welcome, LaCoya. Um, it's all yours. Okay, thank you. Um, sorry. Okay, so I'm introducing Janica. Okay, I apologize. I misunderstood that. Okay, I just want to um, acknowledge a few faces in these squares really quickly. Um, Jane and Kirsten, so good to see you both. I want to acknowledge um, Jacqueline, who is our been our BSU student coordinator and integral in recommending that we do this and Elaine pushing us forward to do this. I'm not sure if Cynthia is on here, but I want to give her a shout out for her hard work as well on behalf of the BSU. Um, I also just want to take a second on a personal note to acknowledge that a dear, dear friend from Chicago is on this call, Rebecca, I see you. And Rebecca has a special connection to both Janica and I, because we all did youth literacy work in Chicago together, which is how we all first <laughs> met. So that just touches me to, to have both of these ladies here many, many moons later in, um, our lives. So thank you, RBIC you. Um, and thank you all for being here. Um, this, is a, this is a moment. I feel like it's a moment because I met Janica, like I said, I don't even want to count the years, many years ago when she was uh, 
fighting through that that PhD program and it's so nice to see where she has um, landed in North Carolina. Janica and I are both daughters of the South. We are both Black women who ended up far away from home and um, um, managed to find our way back in, in really creative ways, but um, she's a dear friend as well as a colleague, so I feel really honored to share this space with her. So I had to get the personal out of the way first, JB. Um, I'll introduce you there, I'll do the formal stuff. So Janica Bowman Lewis um, has a PhD in English that she received from Northwestern University. Her concentration there was African-American literature. She is currently an associate professor of English and the director of the Center for the Study of the New South at the University of North Carolina, Charlotte. Um, she has a book that she published called Freedom Narratives of African American Women. She writes constantly uh, about 19th century African American women's lit and material culture. She also has um, three children's books that are part of my kiddos library here, Brown All Over, Bold Nia Marie Passes the Test, and Dr. King is Tired Too. And her current scholarship in general is on representations of Black girlhood in American literature and film. And then one more personal note, she's a, uh, an honorary member of the auntie team for my, my brood over here. Um, one of the things that I'm most impressed about about what she's doing is Janica's family was, what do I say, bequeathed? Is that, is that the right word? Um, the land. Um, Yes, yes. Yeah, we, we bought uh, land. My, grand, my grandmother and my father bought some land in the 80s that we have tried to keep around and are developing for educational purposes uh, for the community uh, down in Georgia. Um, and this is a project that she was talking about a long, long time ago, how to keep this land in the family and um, sort of had a vision for it when, of course, you can imagine there have been all kinds of conversations about selling it and inheriting the money instead. And so I'm really happy to report that something that, that was a dream for her a long time ago is slowly coming to fruition. I'm really proud of you for that. Um, and then she has a new publication coming out, publishing date forthcoming, but I'll be sure to report back to Antioch, Light and Legacies, Black Girlhood and Stories of Liberation. Um, it's currently under review with the University Press of South Carolina. And Janica, maybe you can tell us a little bit about that before we get started. Of course, and it'll connect a little bit to what we think about today. So it's under contract with the University of South Carolina Press, and it's about the stories of Black girlhood that led to some of the activist narratives that we know today. So Angela Davis, um, who I'll, I'll talk about in the conversation, um, thinking about her childhood in Birmingham at the time when um, the 1963 bombing occurred. She was off at college, but thinking about you know her relationship with this event that happened in her community with girls that her mother taught in Sunday school. And so that's one of the stories and lots of stories about the fact that these women didn't just appear um, as activists outside of community, but what were their narratives that brought them to their own stories of liberation. So that's the new book. Thank you, thank you. Later then, this year, but um, on the way. <laughs> okay, okay. And then did I miss anything else that I should possibly point out about you? No, I think we'll talk about it. Okay. 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 So then I'll get started on our topic. Then I have a little introduction that I've prepared for us. And it begins a little bit in pop culture. And if any of my students are here, you know, this is a, a popular way that I like to enter material. So here you go. Um, and it also is adjacent to Beyonce, which is, I'm also much, very much known for. <laughs> Um, so in the fall of 2016, singer Solange Knowles released an album titled A Seat at the Table. The album was largely considered to be an unapologetic um, tribute to Blackness, Black music, Black culture, Black politics, Black women, visual art, etc. It was um, a massive success in the community and something that sort of helped 
catapult Solange from the status of being Beyonce's little sister. One critic said that the album was imbued with a sense of trying to make sense of the world as a black woman living in it. And Solange herself said that the album was a project about her identity as a black woman, about em empowerment, independence, grief, and healing. Now we could have a whole messy conversation where we break down this album, but for now, there is one track on this album called Mad. And while it didn't have the sort of radio play that some of the other tracks did, it quickly became a fan favorite. It's this instrumental, bluesy, soul R&B sound to the track. It, but it's not heavy on lyrics. And in fact, the lyrics that are there are actually quite simple. The song begins with the chorus of voices singing kind of these common phrases or encouragements that you hear a lot in black culture. Count it all on joy. You got a right to be mad, but you got to let it go. You can't hold on to that kind of stuff. And there are a few rap lyrics by Lil Wayne, but the majority of the song, the song is a conversation between Solange and an unidentified woman who repeatedly asks Solange these questions. Why you always blaming? Why you just can't face it? Why you always gotta be so mad? The first time she asks Solange those questions, there's no reply. There's like instrumental music, there's a pause, and then I guess with no answer, the, the woman starts again with another barrage of questions. Why are you always talking shit? Excuse my language. Why are you always complaining? Why do you always have to be so mad? Why you just can't face it? And this time without hesitancy, Solange offers this one line response in this, this very calm alto voice where she says, I got a lot to be mad about. Now the instrumentals continue to play, Little Rain raps a little bit, you hear those encouragements again about how you got to let it go. But the only other thing that Solange says in the character that is herself is I got a lot to be mad about and she only says it one other time throughout the entire track. Black women loved this song. <laughs> it quickly became an anthem. Um, with the understanding that Solange's one line reply needed no explanation, ex explanation that all was understood in that, that very short reply. And, and a lot of us joke that you, this was like a quintessential auntie moment. Like if you had an aunt who smoked in the eighties or something, that it was like the, the image that you could call up with was a woman sort of pulling on a cigarette, slowly exhaling slowly, barely looking at you and saying, I refuse to hash this out with you. I refuse to explain something along the lines of like, look around, I have plenty to be mad about. And so that's sort of like this, that we'll come back to the song a little bit, but that, that is the idea that we are going to be exploring today. Like this idea that black women have plenty to be angry about. Um, we're gonna talk about just sort of like why this, this notion of black women's anger exists, the value it serves, sometimes the flat out incorrect perceptions or interpretations of it. We'll talk about how it's constantly policed and questioned and ridiculed and critiqued. Um, and also look at sort of like the consequences of what happens when there is no space for black women to express this anger. I wanna also throw in two things. So there's been this popular notion as of late of like black women are unbothered, like that's become a new catchphrase. And um, we'll look at how on Bob, black women being unbothered or the notion of like the strong black women, do they fit on this continuum of the angry black woman or are they different? Have we redefined it in some kind of way? And I'm gonna leave that up for question. Um, but I also want to say too that there's been a lot of work to like debunk this notion of the angry black woman too, right? It's the stereotype that's op often, you know, tossed at black women anytime they say something, oh, you got to be so angry, da 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 da. da. And I, I completely respect that, the rejection of that. I think it'll be interesting to see if we start to hear some of that with these upcoming um, 
Supreme Court hearings, but you know, anyway, it's there. It has a negative connotation um, a lot of times, but for the purposes of our conversation, we are going to acknowledge it um, and try to frame it um, in our own words based on our own experiences. And so we just wanna acknowledge the power in doing that. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, Let's get started. So I I'll say this last thing. We kind of look at Solange. We'll come back to her being this millennial woman. She's under 40. That song came out in her early 30s, sort of talking about this idea of Black women's anger. And we want to look to these literary giants as well, June Jordan, Toni Morris, and Audre Lorde, to see sort of what they have to say about the same idea. And then we're going to talk a little bit about legacy and modern day or present day impact of it, okay? Um, so Janica, talk to me. Um, why are Black women so angry? And why do you believe that that yeah. anger is righteous? Okay, so I first wanna say thank you all for having me in the space. Really excited about this conversation and where this um, kind of idea of thinking about anger came from um, first was that I wrote a whole book, my first book, Freedom Narratives of African-American Women, about these kind of freedom journeys um, of Black women who were enslaved, who sought their own, who paid for their own freedom, who decided not to have children to bring them into the institution of enslavement, all of these narratives. And I realized I didn't write about feelings at all. And I think it was a deliberate decision. How were these women able to protect them what should have felt as a result of the circumstances. I found one sentence where I said, Black had their own feelings, passions, plans, goals, and anxieties that only taking up their own pens could allow them to reveal. And so this conversation about anger comes from what has been not only repressed as a response, but that the world has not created space from. And so when we're thinking about anger, I'm also thinking about the fact that Black women haven't had a space to um, express many emotions. This, this response of having to be literally on all the time, but also, um, as you know, people say, having a lot going on. And I want to um, take a, a moment of silence to think of, of three people who were lost um, over the last week, Ian Alexander, Regina King's son, um, Hyattsville, Maryland Mayor um, Kevin Ward, and also North Carolina native, um, former Miss USA and attorney um, Chesley Christ, um, and was was this morning when talking about um, Janica. Chesley was she seemed to have so much going on? Yes, is going in and out. Just so you know. And let, let me let try, try this. Is that better? Is that better? Say it one more time. Okay. What about now? That's better. Okay, great. Apologies. So I was thinking about um, this, you know, narrative of, of Chesley Christ um, seeming to have so much going on and going for her. And so we're thinking about um, loss, but also these connections between space for emotions and space um, for, you know, taking care of, of ourselves and the space that anger is not allowed to be in. Um, and so, you know, we, we ask, you know, why are Black women mad? <laughs> There's this whole narrative of continuing um, to struggle. And Angela Davis's autobiography has just been um, republished. And she was talking about it this morning, saying we, it makes her recognize how far we've come, but how much further we still have to go. And being ambivalent about telling the story again, but wanting to still write about the struggle toward freedom. And so, in response to your question, that anger is there because that freedom, that liberation that has been sought over centuries, um, is still is still ongoing. It's still a current movement um, that still very much represents struggles of decades ago and even centuries ago. And so, um, Dr. Davis said, "Black women have always done the work, but have rarely been acknowledged." And so, part of this anger is having done the work. Um, but having it not being acknowledged. And you mentioned the strong Black woman uh, trope. It's also this idea of having to be the strong Black woman, having to be, you know, the angry Black woman, another trope, having to be, you know, the Jezebel, the video vixen, all of these tropes that affect how people see Black women 
um, but also don't allow us to represent uh, ourselves. And it, I mean, it ties specifically to um, physical health issues, to mental health issues. Um, there's an article called To Be Black, but To Be Female Anxious and Black by Dr. Angela Neal Barnett, where she talks about anxiety disorders being the most common mental health disorder in the United States. And for Black women, that anxiety very much being tied to um, not having the space to represent emotions and to tell their stories and how it literally destroys us um, to withhold um, responses to um, racism, to you know, workplace issues and not being able to have those spaces to seek help. So we are mad, <laughs> but we also are holding in a lot of the responses to what we are going through um, on a regular basis. It's interesting too, because um, well, Zora Neale Hurston called us the mules of the world, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. black women sort of carry everything. Um, mm -hmm. I heard recently, just over the weekend, a commentator as they were talking about all the Supreme Court stuff saying, again, here we are. So yay, we're going to get our Black woman, but look at what she's going to have to clean up. You know what I mean? Like we always mm -hmm. put Black women mm -hmm. in a place to have to clean it up. And I was thinking, going back to the Solange song, like the ending lyrics of the song say something, oh, I had them say something along the lines of like, I, I'm tired of talking about this. This is draining because the truth is I'm really not allowed to be mad, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so I, I'm curious to know when you think about the necessity for a space for this anger and this rage and these feelings for all that we carry, what does that space look like? What do you think it looks like, like maybe on the personal? And then maybe we can segue that into what it should look like, like in more professional settings, what it should look like systemically. Um, though I know that that's a, a pie in the sky kind of a question. It's not a pie in the sky kind of question. And I think we have to go back to the, the protests, the narratives of protests, right? Which are usually looked at as responses to specific events, but are actually responding to those systems and systemic racism um, that is you know, being endured. And, and I listened to um, the messy conversations one year out, I think that was in July. And um, you know, I were talking about kind of the, the violence that was in the streets, but thinking about where, where violence and where um, protest responses come from as a process um, of naming what actually is going on. And so um, there's a piece which, um, McCoy, you have had um, some of my notes coming from Marvin Gaye's Make Me Wanna Holler, you know, the way they do my life. What does that hollering look like, you know, for Black women? And it's going to the root and saying, you know, we have to name these circumstances. So what that comes um, to be understood as is, you know, just seeing the anger without seeing the root. Just seeing the, um, you know, when you look at all of the images, um, I'll go back to Angela Davis, all of the images of her speaking um, can be perceived as angry, but what are we listening to? What is this content? What is she saying? And so if we speak, we are angry, right? But it doesn't necessarily, you know, mean all people listen, <laughs> like what, what is being said? Um, so I want to think about these ideas um, as we think about like what anger can be. So we have this term, you know, anti-racism, but I want to make the argument that anti-racism doesn't necessarily equate to being pro something. So if I say I am pro, you know, Black women, I am pro educator, I'm pro, um, you know, I'm pro equity, right? What does that bring up? And if I'm yelling, if I'm saying these things over and over again, does that mean I'm angry? Does it mean you know, I'm militant. I'm also pro me. I'm pro black. I'm pro black woman because I am a black woman. I'm pro black liberation because I have black children who are moving around in this world, right? And so when you ask about spaces um, for that anger, it's often where we demand that liberation, right? And so also at the center of that is a fierce love. It's a love for survival. It's a love for, you know, black 
people's rights to thrive and liberation. And that's alongside everyone else who is thriving and surviving. I want that liberation too. Um, but you know, we also know the danger, danger that that anger has brought. And so I've been watching um, women of the movement, knowing you know Mamie Till Mobley's um, story in that that episode. I think it was the first or the, it was the second episode when they call and say, you know, Emmett's gone, and that first response is that fear, right? But at what point, you know, you're like, okay, where is that anger? Where is the anger? And you have her uncle who's going to the sheriff having to say like, yeah, we think it's, you know, we think it's those Bryant boys. But again, like there's not that space for anger because it can cause, you know, more, more trouble. And so another piece of that is, you know, how anger can be read as dangerous um, for Black women. And so when you think about the spaces, you know, or think about spaces at work, how that anger has to be, and I think somebody put in the, the chat coded um, differently to be um, professional, right? And so how you can name um, in different ways, you can, you know, name in writing um, what responses might look like, but you can't necessarily be angry. Um, but my whole argument is that um, Black women have had this righteous possession or a right to or a legacy of anger um, as a response. Um, it, you know, comes from having to be, and this was also in one of your, um, your conversations where someone says Black women haven't always wanted to be warriors, but have had to be um, anyway. And so our quest or our demands um, for not just power, but just equity um, that has been deliberately kept from us is also perceived as anger. And it can be, but again, a reminder not to confuse kind of the flower with the root, what is at the root of what is being uh, uh, withheld. And so I think at that root is the joy of flourishing, <laughs> of growing, of being able to, you know, act within our calling. Um, but uh, still having those outlets to express um, what we need to express. And so I love that, you know, you brought up unbothered because unbothered often means like, I just can't deal with that right now. <laughs> it doesn't mean it's not an issue. It doesn't mean it's not a problem. You know, we have Maxine Waters reclaiming her time. It just means, you know, not right now, but it doesn't mean um, that, that that anger as a response uh, is not there. And so we often do have to code those responses so that people listen um, and not say what we necessarily want to say because you know it may not be received. But again, withholding that anger um, is what causes a whole lot of other issues. And Definitely have code switching to get along. Mm -hmm. And I was gonna say, and we have to think about that in so many different uh, what is this, sections of our lives, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, just mm -hmm. with the babies thinking about just having to deal with all of that medically, you know what yes. I mean? Like wanting to be seen a certain way so I will get the treatment that I know I deserve or I will be treated the way that I want to during this experience. Um, yes. Um, and then, and there's been a lot of talk about that too, just sort of like perception specifically of Black women in these very vulnerable states, how it, even in, we don't eat, we're not even allowed the humanity, and, and I'm talking about childbirthing, but we're not even allowed the humanity at, at that vulnerable state, <laughs> you know what I mean, to possess anger if we need to, in mm -hmm. order to get to the other side of that. Um, well, talk to us a little bit about um, Miss June and Miss Tony and this, this essay that they have, um, and it's interesting that this essay is around politics and elections and things like that. But tell us a little bit about what they say about righteous anger. Absolutely. And so um, when I, I started doing more digging, just where did these conversations about anger come from? Um, I got uh, June Jordan published uh, The Invisible People, an unsolicited report on Black rage in the Progressive in March 2001, and it was republished in her book, Some of Us Did Not Die. And so her essay was talking about 90% or more of African-Americans who voted for Al Gore, and we know his presidency didn't come to fruition, but she says, it's about race, because what doesn't change is the dispossessing and the disenfranchising of Black folks. 
That's precisely what the Electoral College was invented to guarantee, to give power to smaller states that allowed no woman and nobody Black to vote. And so what I love about um, June Jordan's essay is she talks about basically getting on the phone with her girlfriend. And one was to Toni Morrison, and they were talking about this mess, to use uh, Toni Morrison's words, and also Sweet Honey in the Rocks for Miss Reagan, who was talking about Black people having to vote against rather than vote for because their issues were not being attended to. And so Bernice Reagan says, you know, we need to keep the culture of rage, keep it spiked. You have to dig deep to get back to as bad as this. You have to go back to Rutherford v. Hayes and Plessy v. Ferguson. I'm saying, let's make it 84% turnout in two years and then see what happens. And so they came up with this specific plan like, okay, well, maybe if we don't you know, do as much, something will be different. And so Jordan wrote that all of these women share what she called a raging and a sorrow at the, discounted, the, at the discount of our people. She says, we have moved from the invisible man to the invisible people. It's a raging and a sorrow at the terrible meaning of that discount for us and for democracy itself. And that just really resonated, not just the rage, but a raging and a sorrow at that exclusion. And she says, um, they view the most recent triumph of the greater evil with profound shock, anger, and alarm. And so in this conversation, June Jordan and Toni Morrison are, are talking about anger as a necessary response because they have been um, disregarded. And Jordan um, in I can't hear you, Janet. The essay by saying, what does some can know? You went so, out uh, maybe like four seconds, maybe. Okay. The, you were okay. reading the last What quote. does this anger? Back. Yep. Does this anger could know? Um, she asked this question. And can you hear me now? There you go. Um, and so we have this idea of exposing the system out of rage. Um, and that's, you know, that's what their conversations add. Jordan says, we're gonna push and push and make it collapse. And so the anger becomes the source of a plan um, to um, make the system collapse, to literally, you know, take it apart. And so we have their conversation, but also a conversation from Audre Lorde that came 20 years before that, in 1981. And Lord um, reminds us in her essay, which was a talk first, the uses of anger, women responding to racism. She says, my response to racism is anger. I have lived with that anger, ignoring it, feeding upon it, learning to use it before it laid my visions to waste for most of my life. Once I did it in silence, afraid of the weight, my fear of anger taught me nothing. Your fear of anger will teach you nothing also. And so that really resonates because it's like, you know, not just the anger, but the fear of anger that gets withheld and that we don't learn anything from. And so having that outlet, both of them say, is part of our inheritance. It's the way that we need to be able to address um, issues that, that come up. And so um, there's a whole legacy of, of anger narratives <laughs> that you know, we have to deal with. You know? and, and now we're talking you know, 20 years from um, June Jordan's essay. And so mm -hmm. still having this conversation about the legacies of anger and, and why it needs to keep going until the issues at the root are addressed. So then your argument, so, so then here we are, you said 20 years after June Jordan, you and I in our discussion were talking about how we're, you know, roughly four generations now of free Black women, and I put that in air quotes on purpose. Um, would you still argue that, and then thinking about our own girls, Janica, would you still argue, are you there? 
Okay, it looked a little fuzzy. Would you Not argue um, that anger is something that we need to be holding on to now, as well as something that we should be passing on to our, our babies, this righteous anger, um, which I'm hearing righteous anger translated into determination to, to uproot to you know to possibly to let it crumble and i think you're hearing that in various ways too like you have i was thinking about um what's her name hershey's uh take a nap movement you know what i mean and these other resistances towards holding that anger any longer right like you know what? I'm going to sit this fight out. We've mm -hmm. been doing it for years. I don't necessarily feel like this yeah. is my responsibility. I'm going to cuddle my babies while the war rages on, you know, mm -hmm. for a change instead mm -hmm. of being on the mm -hmm. front line. Mm -hmm. And I can honestly say that I felt in addition to feeling moments of anger that I've also felt this. This is not my fight this time. We're going to sit this one out and grow a garden in the backyard. Right. So I'm, I'm interested in knowing how you think about holding on to that anger and then possibly letting that anger go in creation of something new. Or do we are we talking more of a path of the anger coexisting with some other forms of expression? You're frozen. Can you hear me? Oh, no. She's trying so hard. She's got two laptops going, trying to keep her connection going. Okay, it looks like she dropped. There's women, I see another one. Maybe she's trying to get back in. I'm curious if anybody, while she figures that out, if anybody wants to chime in and answer that question and, and I'll try to succinctly phrase it, just. You, I, I can I can I can chime in if you don't mind. I, sure. I know that I'm not part of the, the everyday group, but I, I really appreciate this dialogue and the conversation because I, you know, I'm from Boston originally. My mother was a Panther move, um, um, Panther member and civil rights leader way back in the day, and you know she passed away in 2018. And I've I've been watching things since I was a little girl, and I'm I'm almost 60. And as I, you know, as I, you know, band, raise the band and keep on trudging on, I'm just like exhausted when I think about what Martin Luther King and all of us have been through and looking at the struggle. And yet there's times when I sat there and I said, you know what, I just, I can't, I can't raise the flag anymore. I'm tired of, mm -hmm. you know, where's, where, where have we gone and what have we changed? But I know things have changed. I know we have moved the margin but how much is the margin moved, right? And at the right. same time, do I need to breathe? And where's my sanity, right? right. And, 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 and at the same time, I must fight and I must continue because if I don't, then where, where will we lie? How much can right. we stand, right? But at the same time, we cannot lay down. Mm -hmm. So, Thank you. you know, but, but can my children bleed? Can I continue to bleed? Can I continue to, right. where's my mental health in this whole process? When, right. when, Col when, when, when George mm -hmm. Floyd situation happened and I, my agency is called Healthy African American Families. Everyone called me, what can we do Felika? How can we help you? I was devastated. Mm -hmm. I had no more breath in me. My, my, I was, mm -hmm. my soul weak. Right. Cause I'm a mother of a son. I'm a mother of a mm -hmm. daughter and yet I, I had no energy for anyone, but because no. I'm a human and I'm a mother and I'm a black woman of a son, a black son. And we and have to no talk energy. about, right. And we have to talk about capacity at some point, right? Exactly. We have to talk about survival. We have to talk about maybe there's a time that I'm on the front line and maybe there's a time that I'm not. And my, right. poli my personal politics was always kind of front and center with me. And then I was pregnant during the Trayvon Martin marches. Exactly. I was pregnant when the protests were going on for Mike Brown. Sure. Um, I was pregnant during this recent bout of um, of everything related to George mm -hmm. Floyd. And it was a really interesting thing for me to consider, like, 
that I could either have a role that wasn't angry and on the front line, uh, participating in trying to help this thing fall. Um, it was interesting not to want to send my black husband into that as well. Um, and at the same time, questioning like, where does this anger go? Like, like, like what happens? So Janica, I don't know if you wanted to, but I'm can sorry. I, can, I just, can I just say one, one last thing? Sure. More importantly, <laughs> this, this whole notion is the assault what happens when we get so-called justice, right? In the court system. Mm. That's even more of an assault on who we are when there's no real justice that comes from a system that's set up to, mm. that we're supposed to be happy at the end right. of the day. And that makes it more egregious for me. And so that's, and I'm just gonna leave it at that. And I'll leave, I'll turn it over at that point. Thank you so much for, for speaking. Um, Janica, maybe I'll let you address my, roughly address my question. And then David, I, I just saw your note and then we'll completely open it up. Sure. And it, um, it just put me completely out. So hopefully I'll it's okay. stay, stay in this time. But um, anger is a response, but you, you know, talk about should we hold on to the anger? We should hold on to being able to express the anger. Right, we should hold on to demanding space for those outlets because it's the holding in that you know is is, is causing the issues. But um, two, I didn't talk much about girls, but there's a new book on Demars Hill, "Breath Better Spent: Living Black Girlhood," mm -hmm. and, and this idea of also what it means to breathe, what it means to rest, but to still be able to have those spaces, and it has to be that you know, combination. It has to be that space to breathe. It has to be space to uh, speak, but it also has to be space to express rather than holding on um, just as, you know, the person who was speaking was talking about. You get tired of doing the same thing and saying the same thing over and over again. It has to go somewhere. I think that's, thank you, Janica. Thank you. Um, I think maybe Messy Conversations team, I'm looking for you, you all. I think that's a good place. Janica and I could keep talking about this. We have a lot more prepared, but let, let's see um, if we get any questions from the audience. Thanks, uh, LaCoya. Uh, I think everybody kind of just wants to listen to you to keep talking, but there are a couple of good uh, questions in here. I wanna, the first one I wanna get to is uh, Jacqueline Rose's. Uh, who's asking a question about Black women and therapy and anger. Uh, Jacqueline? Hi, I'm honored that you're here today with us, and I just want to thank both you and um, LaCoya for bringing me into this space. The interesting thing, <laughs> and I was listening to Ms. Jones and you together in that combination of there is that the anger that exists in compartmentalizing um, your your feelings and your aggression and your um, activism and your safety that you have for yourself and for the son of your children. So there's so much involved in the conversation that so so many black women are seeking therapy right now. And and for the therapists out there, I would really, really like for you to offer some advice for the therapist because whether no matter what your background is or the difference that you are as a therapist when that black woman walks into your office and you don't know what she has faced, there's gotta be some type of verbiage that puts you on the right track of drawing that energy out of her. So I was just wondering if you had any advice for um, the people that are on this call. Are you asking us, Janica? I'm sorry. Yes, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, Jacqueline. You, I'm asking you, what would your advice be to a therapist when they have their clients come in, angry Black women? Because a lot of times you go into therapy and then you get traumatized again. You still leave mad. <laughs> you, you got the anger mm -hmm. coming in and then you got the anger walking out of the room after you and sat for an hour on the couch and you paid for that anger. So I think that's something that yeah. also needs to be addressed when it comes to the therapists that are going out into the world and say, I want to be helpful. I want to be a part of this conversation. 
I want to go yeah. into these communities and 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 address these issues, but then the vocabulary is totally um, not appropriate. So that's that's kind of what I had questions about for therapists that are going out there. What what does it look like when you're helping someone? When you're helping an angry black woman? Mm -hmm. Annika. So my advice goes back to looking at um, not just the symptom, um, but the root. And so that reference I made to Angela Neal Barnett, who's a psychologist and professor, she talks about looking at um, anxiety and looking at depression um, and the anger, you know, that may go, go with that. And so she has a book called Soothe Your Nerves, um, the Black Woman's Guide to Understanding and Unco Overcoming Anxiety, Panic, and Fear. And so, you know, often we're just seeing one thing. And, you know, even as we, you know, seek therapy, only one thing is being looked at, but looking at those multiple layers that might be, you know, manifesting as anger, anxiety, depression, you know, multiple things. Um, and so looking beyond just that, that, that one image to see, you know, what is really at the root and not just, you know, how, how somebody is, is, you know, presenting. Um, and that's new that. too. That mm -hmm. that's that's new skill and new and new language for the community in some ways for a community that has relied so heavily on religion and the church. You know what I mean? Like we we've probably been experiencing some of these things for a mighty long time, but but we're told that that was the outlet in which to deal with them, right? So normalizing yep. therapy is a big part of it as well. You know what I mean? And then. I think the second part is then finding practitioners who are knowledge, educated, skilled in, in what Jacqueline is saying um, as well and what you're saying, um, Janica, about the Jays, I'm sorry, um, about understanding mm -hmm. that there may be some root causes underlying whatever comes into that mm -hmm. space, right? Mm -hmm. And that other things are needed, those communities connections, you know, sister circles, conversations, it might not just be one form of addressing, um, but other resources as well. And that's not just with women, that's, you know, with girls too, who are being increasingly disciplined for things like, you know, rolling eyes and, you know, shrugging shoulders and things like that. And, and it's that the behavior is representing um, frustration, but the frustration is not addressed. And um, so that's another layer of it too. If, if I could say one thing um, to that, if I, if I wanna, the one of the things that I realized, we've been working around mental health for a long time. And the whole thing from this negative standpoint that, you know, when we, you know, we're always seen in this negative aspect around how we cope with mental health or these stresses, right? Instead of looking at it from a resiliency standpoint, right? And so, naturally the black woman is advocating for herself is considered aggressive or mm -hmm. angry or this that and the other instead of mm -hmm. understanding that i'm protective and i'm looking at these circumstances i'm saving my family rather than you know this that you know being wild and out right so when my my black daughter or something looking at it's like look i'm protecting my whatever we look at rolling the eyes yeah there's a protective factor it can be construed as negative these therapists have no understanding mm -hmm. of what it feels like to live in my community when you have no sleep at night or helicopters round and round, shooting and going, to, and I have three hours worth of sleep or I have to take an optical course to get to school in the morning and I get there and somebody tells me something negative, don't, you know, you don't have no, you have no understanding of what's, what I'm going through, right? So as a black student, right? As a black child. So these are things that I think mm -hmm. teaching them and understanding the, the culture, understanding, you know, I used to teach for pregnant teens and the Latino schools, and then and for the African American schools, it's different. You have to understand the culture, mm -hmm. you have to understand their experience, and you have to stand, understand that's totally different. Yeah. And for our Black experience, it's totally mm -hmm. different from slavery on out. And this history has not changed very much over all these many years. Mm -hmm. And so for, you can't take that pain away when you still see the same egregious acts that are happening these many years later, and then expect, oh, we should just get over it. Right. Right. That's all fair. Has to be that outlet and the space to tell tell stories. And you're absolutely right. Understanding the culture 
Um, because if not, you're only going to see. But I think the way to train mm -hmm. people is to have these forms like we're having right now to talk about how do you teach a therapist to be to be not just blame the, the, the you know, show the person is in therapy, but also let them know how to listen effectively so that they're not just, oh, we're bipolar or this <laughs> or that or the other, but understanding their trauma, PTSD, mm -hmm. they're in trauma. They're overcoming things. And then you have to understand they're still right. living in this trauma that you are forcing on them. The society is building on them. Yep. And the sy symptoms are being treated, but again, not those root causes, identifying the root. Absolutely. So th this uh, topic has got a lot of action in the chat. Uh, I want to try to get in as many uh, voices as I can. Um, uh, Malikia has uh, raised a number of different issues. Uh, would you like to bring one or two of those into the conversation, Malikia? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, it's Malikia. Malikia, thank you. Um, some of it was just commentary. So, you know, that apathy is really much more dangerous than rage or, or anger. Um, but just listening to the most recent uh, conversation, particularly about children, um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the adultification of Black girls, well, Black, black children in general, but the adultification of Black girls um, in that our expect, what, what would be the behavior of their white counterpart would be seen as childlike. Um, and when it's a black girl, it's seen as more culpable, um, more knowing, older, and more punitive or mm -hmm. more punishable. And so, so there's articles on it, you know, um, but um, it's what fuels the pr uh, prison pipeline. Well, one of the prongs on the prison pipeline. And I just wanted to, to to kind of flesh that out a little bit because I think that that is a starting point of how we are inappropriately viewed as, as angry for no reason. When quite frankly, mm -hmm. if you're not angry, then you're not paying attention. Mm. Absolutely, I mean, thinking about the adult the histories of Black womanhood are that Black girls were not allowed to be girls. Um, just like you said, that innocence was never available um, to them in the same way um, as girls. We have narratives of enslaved Black women writing about, you know, taking care of white children when they were five or six. Um, one woman I write about, Elizabeth Keckley, um, talks about being beaten for dropping a baby, and she was five years old. And so she, you know, never got to experience that girlhood. And so because of that, we've had these ideas of, you know, Black girls as women or perceived as women um, for centuries, and they don't have those platforms to express, you know, their fears and desires as girls at all. And that um, connects um, to this idea of um, criminalization of Black girls. This is Monique Morris's um, push out. Um, where you know she talks about um, these discipline rates um, with black girls, and it's because there is that fear of black girls um, very much as the you know the fear of anger of black women. They they you know are already perceived at early ages um, as something to be afraid of, and we have the same issue um, with black males. That fear that's represented um, comes from you know not these children but people's ideas of, you know, how Black men and Black women um, and even, you know, across binaries move through the world. Um, so adultification, connecting to criminalization, connecting to discipline, and all of that, keeping them from having their, their own identities realized and, and their own, you know, issues understood. Um, so all of what you said. Anything, uh, LaCoya, or should I move on? You can go on. Thank you. Um, and thank you, uh, Malakia, for that question. Um, there's also, uh, Clarence had an early question uh, or comment uh, around language and code switching and all of that. Clarence, do you yeah. want to bring that into the conversation? Um, of course. Um, 
Yeah, what I was referring to was um, an earlier con comment that was being made um, largely on how Black women have to conduct themselves. And I was really um, referencing corporate America, how often mm -hmm. um, as LaCroya um, and JB were referring to having a space where women can actually unpack these emotions and these feelings um, rather than oppressing them. And I was just simply um, calling attention to corporate America where um, black women have to conduct themselves in a manner that they have to basically do code switching to survive so that they aren't constantly being called that angry black woman. Um, and then I look at our current climate and I believe that it was referenced earlier about the conversations around our president's, um, his desire to appoint a black woman as a su Supreme Court justice. And um, I believe it was JB who brought up the fact that several news pundits have been you know, weighing in on it. And I myself have become very annoyed the last couple of days because they are seemingly discounting the importance of a black woman's voice on the court. And you know, now there's a poll that's bouncing ab about saying that, you know, well, it should be more diverse, but there should be other um, ethnic groups and other, um, you know, folk who should be considered and not just black women. And then there was another person who weighed in uh, on another talk show I saw over the weekend who said that, well, if there's a black woman, then she shouldn't be conservative in nature. It should be political. So therefore she should be a moderate liberal. And my thing is, I mean, my view is that we have never had a black woman's voice on the court and whatever her sensibilities are, whatever her political views are, the fact that she lives in the skin of being a black woman, a lot of the things that our conversations have said would live in the form of that human being, that she has no place to come from first and foremost, but being a black woman. Now, what her political views are, you know, they may spun from that or not. But the fact that we would have representation that looks like little black and brown girls on a court would be everything in my view. Um, and I also reference um, for, for, for um, women, uh, Nina Simone's song, just to illustrate the fact in my chat, that you know, we need every flavor of black woman represented in the world, you know. And I can't wait to read some of JB's um, books because you know the idea that you know all of these different um, incarnations of black women from slavery to now have really been devalued. And like Zora Neale Hurston said, she has been the mule. She's carried everything, and she's carried all of our most recent elections through the decades. So for her presence to be denied, for her anger to not be understood, you know, is a problem. It's a problem right now in the 21st century. And I don't want to become that Afro-pessimistic person that I think I'm becoming, but where I sit, I just- Well, Afro-pessimism is a response too, but you know, we had to look at the anger in the same way, um, but absolutely. Well, absolutely. And I also said in the chat that I really feel like the sister, someone helped me out here, who um, she's come out with a book just recently um, during the George Floyd incident. She said that it's a good thing that she was in from Texas, I believe. I think her last name is James. Help me out, somebody. But she said that it's a good thing that Black people just want, um, are just expressing themselves and not getting even, not not, um, you know, not getting, um, you know, back at white people for what they've done. So um, I think, oh, revenge was a word to use, that black people are not taking revenge. Um, and she, she has a new book out, someone help me please. Um, but anyway, I'm saying that to say that, you know, I think that the black woman's um, essence spirit needs to be on that court and we need to amplify the importance of the black woman's voice period 
um, in every space that we actually get the opportunity to because it has been um, too long ignored in American society anyway. And I'm going to shut up. So oh, thank you. Thank you, Clarence. I want to acknowledge that um, our, we officially end right about now. Uh, and so if you need to uh, log off, uh, feel free to do so. Our, our tradition is we keep rolling and more informally uh, for another 15, 20 minutes if you want to hang around for that. Um, and I've got uh, one question that I uh, uh, overlooked. Which it was an anonymous question from a student. Um, so I just want to bring that in. Uh, here in a second. Be sure and come back next week for the book club uh, discussion of the book uh, 1619. But here's the question for uh, you, Janica and LaCoya, which is around you know, w what advice you would have for therapists who happen to be uh, black women. And, uh, and I, that can go a lot of directions. I won't presume where the student wanted to go with it. So, advice for black so, women therapists. Um, first, go yeah, ahead, I, 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 th I think that part partly hidden in that is is you know, it, having to carry so much extra water. Okay, yeah. for the therapist herself. Okay, go ahead, JB. I'm sorry. No, I was, um, thank you for the clarification. So I um, actually consult for our counseling uh, department on um, uh, anti-racist practices. And so one, one piece of that is to take care of and protect yourself. All of these things, the resting, the breathing, the seeking support, you know, have to be um, what you are doing too, because there's this thought that, you know, um, black women, need to be cared for in certain circumstances, but what about doing the caregiving, which we're often in a position to do. And so all of all of this um, advice, I think, you know, goes to the care provider uh, first. What um, does seeking care and support village um, look like for you in order to continue to pour um, into and care for others, but also, um, systems of accountability within your <laughs> work unit, which can be more difficult, right? To have to hold um, colleagues responsible for bad behavior, but, you know, pointing out, uh, and there's no bad behavior at any I know, but um, having, you know, being able to point out where care should be available, where justice should be available in practice and is not um, having spaces to do that and, you know, Anger might be part of that response, but you know, naming and calling out um, those spaces where care and justice are not available in the practice um, of, of therapy and counseling as well. Thank you. I don't I, have I, Go ahead, David. I, I didn't know if you wanted to jump in, LaCoya. No, I, I was just giggling to myself, but because before I um, start my own individual therapy sessions, I always ask my therapist how she's doing. <laughs> and I always ask, like, because she is a Black woman, and I, I just feel the need to check in on her sometimes. <laughs> and um, before I sort of let loose, there's something about respect understanding that she is about to receive all of that. I'm very conscious of it. Um, and sometimes she will elaborate yeah. for, uh, you know, for me about the ways that she is forced for, and I say forced intentionally to take care of herself in order to do the work because what she's taken on is so much, so mighty. Um, so I was just thinking of that sometimes and how much, how much appreci appreciation she shows in that moment. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, so I've, I've got a question, and then I also see that Ahmad has uh, his hand up, but, but he might be gone right now. Uh, so let me ask mine real quickly, which, you know, part of the, the title uh, of the talk referenced the, the notion of righteous anger. And of course, you know, mm -hmm. anger is vitally important. Uh, it also has its debilitating qualities. And, and so, you know, I, I wonder if you, uh, Janica, and or LaCoya could ar articulate, what are some of the characteristics of, of righteous anger? You know, what, what's the, how is it different and, and not debilitating? 
Hmm. So it, it can be, it can be debilitating, absolutely. But I think it's that repression that is the harmful part. And so I use righteous because they have a right to it. <laughs> it is, they can own it. It is their legacy. It is their inheritance to have that anger, but also to have spaces for that anger to be, to be let out. And so I think, you know, when it's most harmful is when we're just holding it. We just, you know, day after day, you know, day, just holding it um, and, and operating with that within. And so I think the ownership um, of the anger and also that space is what helps it to um, be productive. Um, it helps it to go somewhere and to turn into something else. So, you know, the righteous is, is, is theirs. Uh, they don't have to explain it. <laughs> they don't have to ask for permission. You know, they are angry we are angry, you know, period, but, um, you know, not having to, to explain the right to it is that piece. And LaCroix, we talked about this a little bit. I think you asked me the same question. So I wanted to add anything, you know, to that. Well, I was thinking, David, is your question rooted in the idea of like, say, sort of like looting or something like that would not be a productive um, expression of anger? Is, is that, part of your question like um, it would be more productive to work towards I don't know can't I'm just saying like campaigns or something like that to change policy but not necessarily to be in the street yeah I appreciate you asking so so it doesn't doesn't come from there it, it, okay. it you know it comes from it, it's the teacher part of myself and and I'm thinking about an audience uh, mm -hmm. who may not understand you know so what is the role of anger uh and and and, mm -hmm. can, and 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 how does it how does it function and and what what why why is it called righteous anger instead of just anger and, and my experience you know anger is what i'm working on in therapy and so why is this okay you know th th those kinds of questions and not a sense of the role of anger and the work of love you know which, which mm -hmm. is fundamental right you, 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 so it, it comes from from there lacoy okay janica you got anything else <laughs> that we can hold multiple. So I love David that you said, you know, the anger and the work of love. I can love my community so much that I want them to have, you know, access to X, Y, Z. And so then that anger can turn into mobilization. Like, who do I need to yell at? What do I need to do, you know, in order to move somewhere else? But, you know, kind of the whole premise is that we, we often discount anger because we don't feel like we have a right to exactly anger for love's sake. And justice, you know, a desire for justice comes from that. Like, I love X so much, I want them to have. And so my argument is that anger can be a part of that because it can allow us to have this conversation. I love that everybody came in to, you know, to talk about anger, to think about, you know, rights, rights to anger. But I think it's the expression of the anger that moves to then something else, uh, rather than just normalizing the injustice and being like, well, I'm just going, you know, nothing's going to change. Um, you know, to Clarence's point about pessimism, nothing's going to change. So I'm just not even going to say anything, or I'm not even going to mm -hmm. do anything. But the anger allows. Um, that voice of what's wrong to then move somewhere else. Yeah, absolutely. Speaking and sharing anger can be an act of love. Um, one of my good, you know, therapist friends talks about the gift of feedback. And so basically, even if somebody is cussing you out, they are giving you the gift of feedback that you might not want to hear. You might not be welcome to at some point in time. But, you know, the fact that they care enough to share, <laughs> which you know, isn't always what we think about, but hmm. the anger has to has to go somewhere to move them. I love it. Thank you. Uh, Ahmad, you've been very patient. Uh, you want to come in? You, yeah, good evening. Um, you, you hit on it in reference to anger, um, David. Uh, I'm listening and I'm listening with a third ear as, um, and I'm, I'm saying to myself, when I'm in when I'm in class or when I'm going around the building and I'm responsible for these young um, black and brown young ladies, um, we have to define clearly what that anger um, looks like for those who don't understand the climate and culture in which 
these young ladies are coming from. The misuse of that word anger uh, with someone young and depending on how it's being explained at home. And I wanna be clear, not that it's not valid because it's very valid, but my job and responsibility in that workplace is to make sure I'm consistently bringing on professional development and sharing in our community what that means so they don't have what was mentioned earlier. Here comes the suspension rate. Here comes them having an attitude. Why do you have that attitude? Well, I have an attitude because I had a conversation with my mom last night and she was explaining to me what happened at her job and how she has to deal with code switching and never being in her natural space because she's always being judged, right? So we have to relentlessly share that with our peers uh, in the workplace, at least in education, because it's not fair to that young lady feeling like she has a, a right to express herself, which she does, and the people that we're holding responsible to let her navigate and express these feelings have a mystery because they don't necessarily believe that the anger should be justified. Because at the end of the day, from a pedagogical standpoint, at least in the state of New Jersey, you can be in the state of New Jersey, for example, and never take a black history course and teach history. Mm -hmm. African-American history, that is. So mm -hmm. that being said, I just wanted to just share that because I think it's of, it's, it's of the utmost importance to make sure we're arming our young ladies and, and, and breaking that down. So they are aware that there's gonna be people there that's not gonna understand your justifiable anger. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And another question is what are the outlets for that anger? So, you know, is it play? Is it dance? Is it poetry? And we know that a lot of these arts programs are being removed or cut right, um, from right. schools. And so if I'm not learning the history and I'm not having outlets, like, yeah, that anger may cause harm. And so the right. other piece of that um, is, you know, and this is definitely for educational systems, how are, and you use the word expression as perfect, how are students able to express any emotions, including anger, what are the outlets to then move that somewhere so it's not self-directed and it's not directed and it's not misdirected. So it's not the yeah, anger last, itself, but where is it able to go? But last but not least, it, and then, you know, we have our beautiful black and brown young ladies. You know, they, they're at the dating phase too. I'm pre-K to eight right now. So they're dating and then you have our young men. It's okay, why are you mad? I mean, they they have a total disconnect. They're not understanding that. So I just think there needs to be some conversation because I don't appreciate them being analyzed as angry by their peers because they're not understanding where their pain is coming from. Because that's they're mad too. But that's something that we gotta, you know, that's that's complicated. Yeah, and when you talk about the relationship part, that's something that Black boys are fed about Black girls, right? That they just have this nasty anger and that's just what, you know, that's what it is. And it either has to be tamed or, you know, there are other groups of girls who don't express that way or feel that way and therefore that is better or whatever. I was going to say too about the educational system we're about to have to have book clubs come back because if they keep removing books from school you're talking about expression and access to knowledge we're about to have to sneak them Toni Morrison in a minute um, sneak them mouse <laughs> you know what I mean in order to educate them on something other than what certain people want them to be educated on just thinking about expression outside of the classroom and that was some of the work that we did right allow them to have access to books and poetry that whoever determined curriculum undermined it and said it wasn't valuable enough so I'm sorry for interrupting but that is um kind of the topic of a mod in my research is that we're lying to children in school and so we're repeating history so mm -hmm. the to answer the question of what are they being taught and and who created the curriculum school public schools were created by white men and um there is also a huge whitewashing going on now where they're banning this topic of racism florida has a law to that stands to be passed that says you cannot talk about racism racism in schools and private companies if it makes white people uncomfortable and the wording says white people uncomfortable 
North Carolina, Texas. Texas has specifically banned 1619 Project. Yes, and Texas is, aren't they the only state too that whose curriculum is not um, reviewed or uh, by the federal agency of review? They do their own thing from the get go. Their textbooks come from Texas companies written by them. <laughs> I get excerpts from friends all the time. Yeah, so many schools, so I used to do some education law. Many, the curriculum can go without saying whatever, it, like the textbooks can go without saying whatever they don't want it to say, right? And the federal government doesn't necessarily regulate in that way. Okay. Um, but the issue is that there are, it is a state right, it's a state's autonomous right to say, we're not gonna talk about slavery. We're not gonna, we're gonna remove that from our history and our curriculum. And you know, the federal government can't withhold funds for that because those aren't their mandates. They don't get to mandate that um, oversight. We, we get away with it in the sense of, how, in New Jersey, we're the only um, state that has the Amistad legislation in the state of New Jersey. So we're able to infuse it, but we have a, a checks and balances, um, which is called CUSAC. And only that when the state comes down here and, and, and looks for this and wants to see this, now we're gonna get a mm -hmm. different, hopefully we're gonna get a different response because even with it being the law, it's not being implemented like, like it should be. Mm -hmm. So I'm uh, conscious of our time and I'm seeing a lot of people uh, log off. I wanna do two things real quickly. One, one is um, I'm, I'm so appreciative of the concrete nature of this conversation. Uh, I think that's wildly helpful to the work we're trying to do in messy conversations. So thank you all for that. Also, I want to acknowledge that the so one person I haven't gotten to is Gabriel. I don't know if you're still here, Gabriel, but Gabriel had a question about you know the, the political purpose of pathologizing black anger. Do you want to bring your mm -hmm. question in and then we'll wrap it up? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I basically asked um, what purpose has the racist societal pathologizing of black female anger served and how is um, it political? How is this anger political? Um, yeah, I could expand if you want, but I think there's a lot in there. Mm. There's a lot in there. You want in first, Lakoya? No, I, I mean, I, I'm defaulting to you. I was thinking about um, the idea of, of, of creating tropes, though, and, and how that allows you to create a picture, a monolithic picture of a group of people, and you just kind of like... <laughs> simmer it down to that one thing. But that goes back to your your point as well about not being willing to listen. It gives you a reason not to want to address the root, right? Because now you've created this picture of, of black women. Um, you can't communicate with them. They're always, they're always so much. It's always blah, blah, blah. You know what I mean? And so then we don't have to entertain it. But I'm sure you could say that much better than me. No, I absolutely agree because that anger allows it to, us to be dismissed also politically, right? But then you have like a Shirley Chisholm with unbought and unbossed, right? I'm going to tell me how to represent myself um, and those in that legacy before her, you know, Sojourner Truth, who was part of um, early women's movements before, you know, women were even included in, in uh, political legacies and definitely not Black women. Um, and so uh, I think politics had been a way to um, discount Black women's voices, you know, mm -hmm. from its very nature, but it's been a story that we're re rewriting. I mean, as you all have said, even at this moment, um, what needs to happen for Black women's voices to be included because there has been fear of those truths being named by Black women, so. Mm. Um, I know, Stacey oh, Abrams, she's so angry, right? Oh, the nerve yes. of her to fight so that people can vote or to or to call out what y'all are doing with your redistricting. To create and organizations. To how register. dare she? And she yeah, and she's so said, angry and unapproachable. Yeah, and other people benefited from her 
registering voters. So she says, I didn't even get all the votes of the people I registered. Right. But, you know, but I'm angry because I want people to be able to vote. Right. right. So I think that thing. goes to, 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 to defining anger for ourselves as well, instead of letting outside entities define it for us and, and speak about how it impacts us <laughs> or, you know, to David's question, how we then utilize anger in productive ways, you know, um, but I, I think to, to say that this is from a place of anger that we have created all these other things, so. Uh, those and if of you us erase that... the histories, then we don't know why they're angry. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. What do they have to be angry about? I got a lot to be mad about. Those workers in, you know, Texas, <laughs> where are they mad? So, active erasure. Right. Sorry, David. No, no, I was just, uh, that just, I wasn't going to get in your way. Uh, I was <laughs> just wrapping things up, I think. Um, uh, and I wanted those of us that are left to, to show our, our love and appreciation for uh, Janica and LaCoya and this really fantastic conversation. Thank you for staying, uh, hanging out. To, to wish Janica all the luck in the world with your new book when it comes out. Um, a fantastic way to kick off uh, Black History Month um, yep. starting up tomorrow, which is also uh, the anniversary of the, 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 the murder of uh, Malcolm X. Um, so thank you all. Um, look forward to seeing you. David, I had, a, I had a question, David, before we go. Um, I think some powerful things were stated. If, if, there's, if there's a way that we can take, like, some of this great information and have action steps because what was just stated, um, infusing how we define anger, let's say for, for example, that was just stated, being able to have bullets of how we are defining that and that being infused in pre-K to let's say eight or 12, folks need to know that these kind of conversations are happening and they're real because there's a huge disconnect with that. So we can have takeaways and action steps the great conversation could be being infused maybe the next day, you know, mm -hmm. um, in, in a classroom or in a PLC. So I'm just looking at it from that lens. Yeah. Yeah. I, identifying I really... the outlets, number one, identifying the outlets. If they're not there, where do they need to be? And that's K-12, that's college, that's workplace, you know, where people to speak and be, be heard. And I appreciate you all having these conversations for sure. Yeah, and thank you, Ahmad. I, that it's part of the work that we need to get better at with messy conversations, um, and so I really appreciate that. Uh, th thank you all. Uh, we'll see you next week uh, for sixteen nineteen discussion, which should be fantastic. Um, so, thank y'all for having us. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for the invitation. Yeah, really a pleasure to get to meet you um, and, and so grateful for this conversation. Yeah, come back when the book is published. You have another conversation. <laughs>